Okay, so here's the deal with the XM8500, which I'll assume if you're here, you're here for the XM8500, and you're wondering if you really need to spend the price necessary to get like an SM57 or an SM58. So that's sort of the thing here. The XM8500 is considered to be this wonder mic by a large group of people. A mic that should not be $20, that hits so high above that threshold. I mean, you can get like a large order from a drive through restaurant or you can get a full metal dynamic microphone with a hard case too, which is crazy. So I want to answer that question myself and throw my two cents in here on whether or not a $20 microphone can really be that good. Well, let's start with the setup first and then we'll get to the good and then we'll get to the bad. And all along the way, we'll be switching between the XM8500 and the SM57 as you've already seen because I really think the SM57 is the true budget king or an SM58, they're, they're basically the same thing. Just take the pop filter off or put a pop filter on this one. So we're running like a mega budget rig today. This is the Behringer special, if you will. It's the UM2, which is a 30 to $40 interface, and the XM8500, which is a $20 microphone, topping out at a total of around $50. $50 for a full XLR interface setup. Insane. We are also operating in a completely reflective attic space, untreated room for the worst environment possible because if you're watching this video about the XM8500, you have a terrible space too, don't lie. So this is like bare bones budget, which I know is what you guys all wanna hear. Let me just start off by answering this basic question I set up at the beginning of this video. Is this $20 microphone really worth it? Yup, it is insanely good for $20. I don't see how they made a $20 microphone sound this good. It is likely the only dynamic microphone I would consider for $20. It's built really robustly, regardless of price. This is a full metal microphone with a full metal grill, and although it is slightly lighter than an SM57, it gives that same confidence-inspiring, robust feeling that any dynamic microphone should give. It feels like it will survive an apocalypse. It's not particularly gain-hungry, needing around two to four dB less than an SM57 does. Now, that may not sound like a lot, but when you're working with budget audio interfaces, two to four dB is actually quite a lot. It's the difference between a signal that may not reach nominal levels with a gain-hungry dynamic microphone and actually reaching those levels. But Here's a little secret. If you actually know what you're doing with processing, it doesn't really matter. After a certain threshold, I'd say around 52 decibels of gain or something like that, you can really get around it. Although there are some out there with like 45 and that's just not enough. Now, it should be noted that although it performs more or less marvelously in all of the categories I mentioned, the SM57 still outshines it in both sound and build quality. Although it is admittedly more gain hungry. And if you're working with a low wind interface, that might be a worry for you. So I know I left you guys hanging and I didn't go into the sound too much. That's because we're gonna listen to a blind voiceover of the two microphones. You can make some opinions yourself without hearing the, the microphones having the bias of sight. Then we're gonna get into the tone in a little bit more detail. So enjoy the origin story about why I'm scared of birds because some of you were asking. So in my last review, I explained how I was terrified of birds and I was asked to expand on this. So here we are. In this video, I will be explaining where my fear of birds originated from. It originated from geese, specifically Canadian geese. See, there are two kinds of Canadian geese here in America. Those who live here full time and those who migrate from Canada. The ones who live here all year round, for the most part, are fine, but the ones who migrate, man, there's something wrong with those assholes. Anyways, migrating geese would always nest and lay eggs at my old college campus, so I was consistently always surrounded by territorial nesting Canadian geese. So basically, I've been attacked four times. And one time, they saw me from like 50 feet away and charged. I was carrying like a bunch of notes and paper and stuff, and it spilled everywhere. I even had to have my friends make a circle around me because I was so scared that they would come back. So yeah, the unease I feel around birds has never left, especially geese and actually swans. F swans. Have you seen how big those beasts are? No, thank you. They haven't actually attacked me, but... 
I think one day they will. Now that you've had a listen to both the microphones blind, let's get into the bad stuff. So the Behringer, unfortunately, has quite a poor handle on the low-end and low-mid-range information, leaving much of the sound sources I've tested as overly muddy or too overly dark. Now, the good news here is, to my ears, the problem seems to be more of a buildup of low-end than a lack of high-end information, meaning it doesn't seem too hard to EQ out that low-mid-range mud, and with a bit of processing special sauce, you should be able to get all of that sort of muddiness out of the equation. As I will demonstrate now. So this is a little bit of EQing, a little bit of compression, and a little bit of my secret special recipe, which is actually just Golfoss, which is a, an intelligent EQ doing resonance control, as well as a bit of mild distortion from a saturator plugin. You know I wouldn't actually leave you hanging on that, right? I'm not going to leave anything secret. <laughs> now, beyond this, the SM57 definitely has a brighter tone regardless of the low-end buildup of the XM8500. It does also have a much better control and much cleaner response to the mid-range. It's less fuzzy. It feels more realistic to the actual sound of the instrument or the voice you're recording. It translated to much clearer, more realistic guitar tones, and it seemed to break up in a much more controlled fashion during higher volumes. It also seems to be poorer at room rejection. During my test, it it caught a lot of my cat's insane shenanigans and ruining many of my guitar takes. It does not, however, seem to produce more hum, thanks mostly to the fact that it's not particularly gain-hungry for a dynamic microphone. There's also the moral conundrum with buying a Behringer product, a company known for blatantly stealing or ripping off other companies' ideas, producing at the very least ill-intended pieces of product. I'm not going to go too deep into that on a review channel, but you should look it up. And is perhaps the company least accepting of criticism. At least they have been in the past. They are getting better though. So with that, let's hear some blind guitar comparisons on both electric and acoustic. So I'm running a Made in Japan uh, Fender Jazzmaster through a full tone OCD, a Zvex box of rock, and a 1950s Fender Basement 4x10 reissue. Both mics are set to be three and a half inches away from the center of the cone, that's a 10 inch speaker, going directly into the Behringer UM2 and then into Ableton. Thank you. 
So with that out of the way, is the XM8500 the budget king a lot of people are making it out to be? Yes, I believe it is. The idea that this microphone is $20 and comes with a hard case is mind-blowing to me. To me, this easily is a $60 to $70 microphone. If you're in a bind, this microphone is great, but you should expect a little bit of a compromise. It is overly muddy and overly dark, so I would get used to processing. It is your friend here. Learn how to EQ, learn how to compress. If you know how to do those things, I guarantee you, you can get this microphone sounding better than the average Joe plugged into an SM7B and no processing at all. If you know what you're doing and you're using your audio engineering skills, this microphone can certainly sound better than the average person with a $500 to $1,000 setup. So with that, guys, I hope it was helpful. You can follow me on Instagram at Real Audio Haze if you'd like to work on a project with me, things like a custom vocal chain, mixing a song, helping you build a studio. Maybe you need a second opinion on a reference track. You can email me here. And with that, uh, goodbye. Goodbye. I'll see you later. <laughs> <laughs>